important for us to have a complex view of other people, not just a surface view, but a complex one. Uh, the th theory we're going to look at today, constructivism, kind of asks the question, how complex is your view of the world and of other people? And I think a lot of us, it's hard to have a complex view of other people in situations because we're hit with so much information. Uh, let me just read a couple things to you. Uh, first, According to one estimate, more new information has been cranked out in the last three decades than in the previous five millennia. The total amount of printed knowledge doubles every eight years. The phrase, I read that somewhere, but I can't remember where, has become uh, an epidemic. The result, information anxiety, described as the black hole between data and knowledge. The difference between the two, data is raw material and is passive. Information is active and ideally at least enlightening. As we thrash around in the overabundance of the first, the second becomes ever more elusive. So we are in what they call today an information explosion. And this is just talking about printed material. Imagine all that you can get just on your laptop. All the information and different perspectives. I find it fascinating that on your laptop you can read um, the Detroit Free Press this morning, you can read the Moscow Times, you can go around and get the perspective of people living in different countries, different points of view. Think of all the different blogs that are out there representing all the different viewpoints that are out there. Uh, in our book, The God Conversation, I simply talked about uh, religious differences and this is how we started our chapter. Consider these facts. One out of every five people in the world is Muslim. In 1990, there were 30 mosques in the United States. Today, there are more than 3,000. On average, one new mosque opens each week in the United States. From 1990 to 2001, Buddhism grew in the United States by 170% and is now the fourth most practiced religion in America. If you Google Buddhism, you will get more than 37 million sites. A total of 60% of the world's population does not identify itself as Christian. So not only are we hit with an information overload, but we're really hit with uh, a people overload. There are people that come from very different viewpoints. Even within this university, as you get your 30 units of Bible, you start to realize there are complex theological disagreements in our community. Um, uh, deep theological disagreements. If you take a church history class, you'll realize the church has been predicated on some very profound disagreements. People see things in very different ways. So the communication theory we're going to take a look at today asks the question, how complex is your viewpoint? When you think about theological issues, how complex do you know the other perspective? When it comes to political issues today, how complex is your view of the person who holds the other political persuasion? Uh, this theory, constructivism, asks the question, what do you do with the avalanche of information that you take in on a daily basis? Fully recognizing we're in the information explosion age and that we're meeting incredibly diverse people. So I want to introduce you to what is probably, pound for pound, my favorite communication theory. Uh, when I was asked to speak on the Jesus mural last year, I shared key components of constructivism. Now, I never mentioned that term, but what I taught them has become one of my favorite, most useful communication theories in daily life, in ministry, uh, in, a, in really any kind of human activity. So let's first define what we mean by constructivism, and then we're going to take a look at, I think, the four key components, and then we're going to take a look at uh, what we call cognitive complexity, which to me is probably the most useful thing uh, I've come across in communication theory. Okay, so the term is constructivism. Not to be confused with social constructionism. Totally different concept. Uh, constructivism is a theory that explains, describes, 
and predicts individual thought. Uh, it was founded by a man named George Kelly. in the 1950s. Uh, it maintains that people develop very complex structures in order to understand each other and very complex structures to take in information on a daily basis. To understand constructivism, you have to understand the three key ideas most associated with constructivism. First, we have what we call cognitive schemata. Cognitive schemata. Schemata, if you want to think of it, are many systems that you use in your brain, in your interaction with people. There are many systems that help you structure all the information that you're taking in. I mean, think about it. If you were to deeply think about all the issues that you encounter on a daily basis, from political to religious to social, um, you'd be overwhelmed. To think complexly about everything would require time that, quite frankly, we don't have in what sociologists call a hurry-sick society. So the question becomes, when I get this information coming at me, how do you begin to file it? What are the... Uh, file folders you set up in your brain in order to quickly take in all the information that you get that can be really overwhelming. Schemata organize your perception and help you think fairly quickly about information. So they're like many systems of judgment in your brain. We call these schemata. Now, uh, we, there are generally recognized by psychologists four different schemata that you use uh, on a daily basis. First is what we call uh, prototypes from a marker that doesn't work. Ah! Hey, by the way, I've been on fire in basketball two days in a row. Unbelievable. Watch this. Watch this. Doesn't matter. Bank shots do not matter. That is two points. It does count. Prototypes. What are prototypes? A prototype is the clearest uh, case or best example of a category. Uh, a prototype is the clearest case or the best example of a category. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Uh, think back to junior high, high school, college. If you say college, do not give me a name, okay? Tell me about the most boring class you've ever had in your life. I mean, mind-numbing, boring. Geology. Geology. What was boring about it? Yeah, you're studying rocks. So, yeah. I mean, there were some cool things like uh, volcanoes that you studied and that. Yeah. But when it got into the studying the sedimentary rocks and that, it was just looking at earth. Yeah, mine's very common, very similar. I'll tell you in a little bit. Yeah. Wait, so if it's in college, do we say the name? Of do the not person? say the name of the person. Okay. okay. Give me the general category. Right. Um, it was U.S. history, and it was like eight o'clock in the morning. It was okay. Super dry and boring. Okay. So. Eight o'clock in the morning, super yeah. dry, boring U.S. history. Yeah. Yes. Pre-calculus, which I'm horrible at math, yeah, but it was the teacher. Uh, what about the teacher specifically? Um, his tone um, and voice, just the way he described things. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Biology. Biology. Yeah, okay. The teacher one wasn't accredited, and two, she was just extremely Okay. She uh, she wasn't accredited. She was just like they needed a teacher like as soon as possible. Okay. We need a teacher. <laughs> I'm really a theater major. Great. Okay. Uh, worst class I've ever had in my life? Earth Science. Eastern Michigan University. Earth Science. 
Uh, one, we're studying dirt. You can call it whatever you want to. It's a semester studying dirt. Okay? But the teacher was a stout man who would wear pullover shirts that didn't make it all the way. I, I kid you not. I kid you not. And he would cross his legs, play with change, and rock. And every time he rocked, his shirt would go up and down, and the man's talking about dirt. You know what got me after a while? It was the change. It was the change that got me. I wanted to yell from the back, a buck fifty. Okay? Oh, horrible. Horrible class. All right. Conversely, best class you've ever taken. And if it's at Biola, you can actually say the professor's name. Best class you've ever taken. Junior high, high school, college. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was just a great teacher because he, he represented, he showed you the side that they wanted to teach and then the side of history that they don't want to talk about. Good. Anybody else? Best teacher, yes. An improv class in high school. Improv class in high school. Wasn't it? Oh, I've, I've taken an improv class, so that's really fun. Anybody else? Best class, yes. Thank you. Did she say that a lot? Did that get picked up on that? Okay. <laughs> yes, best class. Uh, Theo 2 with McKinley. Okay, the Theology 2 with McKinley. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, mine was an a, uh, advanced theater class with Dr. Annette Martin. And uh, she was radical, but she was great. Uh, she would say to us, listen, in good theater, you have to prepare. If I perceive during your performance you've not prepared, I I'll just stop you. So you're doing a solo performance, and a senior is going, and she said, uh, Chuck, Chuck, let's just stop. Next. And the rest of us were like. <laughs> and by the way, she gave you your senior project. She gave it to you. So I remember sitting down with her in her office. She goes, ah, Tim, my Christian Tim, my Campus Crusade for Christ leader Tim. And she handed me what I was to do. It was a woman crack attic in prison. <laughs> and I just looked at her and I said, yes ma'am. <laughs> and did it. It was, it was so powerful the way she got people to buy into theater, performance, being the other really. Um, so here's what happens. Okay? You have a prototype for the worst class you've ever taken in your life and you have a prototype for the best. By the way, we could do that for everything. The best date you've ever gone on. The best. This was awesome, the worst date you have ever gone on in your life. You just wanted to look at the clock. This was horrible. I didn't even like my meal. This was terrible, okay? So here's what we do. When you take a class, you immediately compare every class to the prototype. So you sit in a class and you say, oh, this class is boring. This, but it is not earth science. That's varsity boring. This is probably JV boring, okay? That's Death Valley boring. This is boring, but not like that. Best class, oh, it's awesome, but it's not a Lundy. Oh, this was awesome, but there's no way this was a birding, right? Okay, this was good. So we do that immediately. Now, let me tell you a really interesting thing with our prototypes. It would be so funny to actually be transported back to Earth science. Right now, be teletransported back and actually see that poor guy. Right? I bet you, I bet you, he's slightly overweight. Just slightly. And his shirts were a little tight. And you know what I mean? It wasn't what we made it out. And that horrible date you went on, that horrible, horrible date, if you actually go back and relive it, it probably wasn't all that bad. It was bad, but not that bad. Our prototypes really get cemented. And by the way, you have a prototype for everything. What would be a good marriage? Bad marriage. What would be a, a, a good university compared to a bad university? But a prototype, when you think of something, a category, oh, that was a good chapel talk, but it was not like when Thomas got up and that was, oh, I was weeping in my Bible and, you know what I mean? It's just all that kind of, but, but that was good, but it wasn't Thomas. We do that all the time, right? In really bad ways. Oh, you're a good woman, but you're not my mother. Ma mom is. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, kind of things. Make sense? We use these prototypes 
all the time. Okay? The clearest case, the best example, or the worst example, and we use that as judgments. Um, the worst Thanksgiving you ever had in your life. The best Thanksgiving you ever had. The worst Christmas, the best Christmas. One Christmas, uh, I wanted a, a BB gun desperately, desperately, desperately. My dad said, I'm not handing you a BB gun. I'm not, I've seen you with your brothers. I'm not handing you a BB gun. So we waited, 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 waited. We had Christmas dinner was done. I didn't get my BB gun. Okay? So after dinner, my dad goes, you know, I heard some noise last night. I could have sworn somebody was rummaging around in the closet. I, I wonder if Santa wasn't in the closet. Tim, go check the closet. I was like, okay. Open it up. There's a BB gun wrapped up. Aww. My best Christmas, right? Right? Um, yeah. Then I shot my brother with it. My dad smashed it across a tree. But <laughs> Ken deserved to be shot. We were playing make-believe guns. He was up on the roof. Clearly, I was hitting him with my make-believe gun. Clearly. There was no way he wasn't hit. He said he wasn't hit. I said, fine, I'll show you a hit. I go got my BB gun up on the roof, bam, hit him right above the eye. He is screaming on the roof. Me and my older brother get the ladder, go up there, grab him, take him down. Now he's downstairs in the basement screaming. My parents come home. My dad's like, what's going on? I'm not then. Uh, Ken, he shot my eye out. He's got his hand. My dad comes downstairs, looks at me. Gets the hand, his eyes right there. He's <laughs> my dad takes the gun, bam, smashes. He said, you do not shoot any living thing. I didn't. I shot my brother. <laughs> okay? Uh, second, or what we call personal constructs. Personal constructs. These are bipolar dimensions of judgment. They are bipolar, and the bipolar is important, dimensions of judgment that allow us to measure something along a particular line of thinking. But they're bipolar dimensions of judgment. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean this. As soon as you meet somebody, you, do, uh, you kick into a, uh, a personal construct. What is that construct? It's a snap judgment in which you meet a person, you immediately think uh, intelligent, unintelligent. You immediately think that. Uh, you meet a person, you think um, Christian, non-Christian. You meet a person, you think, ooh, spiritual, not spiritual. Uh, you meet a person, uh, an easy one is uh, dating material, not dating material. Marriage material, not marriage material. Okay? You immediately kick into these snap judgments. It happens incredibly fast. I remember reading an article by the Wall Street Journal talking about interviewing people. And they really said, based on this kind of study that they did, that in an interview, that interview pretty much talking to executives and people who hire is over in 30 seconds. That thing is done in 30 seconds. If you do not impress them in 30 seconds, you're done. And they really said things like, guys, a handshake. A handshake is huge. Yeah. Now, what's the, what's the construct we go into right away when, we, when two men shake their hands? We go masculine, feminine. Okay? Now, women, you got it even rougher because when a man shakes your hand, th the shaking of your hand is kind of weird because, one, it cannot be really soft. It can be, but it can't be that, right? Because then you get feminist whatever, okay? I mean, you get, you get trying to, you know what I mean? Too, not feminine enough, but that was trying too hard, okay? We kick into these constructs immediately, okay? Um, I did what you did. Well, you sit in a brand new class and that guy or that woman stands up. And how long does it take you to determine whether this is going to be a snoozer of a class? How long? You know what I mean? I, oh, I used to judge so quickly. Chapel service, we do that too, right? Person gets up in chapel. It is three Mississippi. And you're thinking, boring, 
interesting, and that, that person's boring, right? They're inter the way they dress, we do this immediately. Now, another thing about personal constructs. First impressions are really hard to overcome. Now, they can be overcome, and often can be, but that first impression you have of a person really tends to last. It really does. So, these personal constructs we use all the time. Uh, very interesting. We could talk all day long about where those came from. I mean, how did you get this idea of masculinity, femininity? Where did you get this idea of, oh, that person is spiritual and that person's not spiritual? Where did those ideas come from is what we would study in my gender class. And for sure, we'd study in my family communication class. Where did you get this idea of, um, that's a real job, that's not a real job? My, my dad had that construct. He worked in the factory his entire life. And when I went off, became, went to school, uh, and then was a theater major, for crying out loud, he was like, that thing. A job, you come home physically tired. That's a job. Okay? So these are incredibly important ways to judge people. Uh, number three, we use, and you're probably very familiar with these, stereotypes. Stereotypes. which are uh, simply uh, predictive generalizations. Predictive generalizations about people and experiences. Okay, predictive generalizations. Um, My wife and I lived overseas for a year in Lithuania uh, before we had kids. We stayed in Moscow for uh, probably seven weeks before we actually got to Lithuania. Uh, how many of you have met a Russian? Actually met a Russian. How many of you have never met a Russian? Uh, a person, okay. What, what's a Russian like? Um, well, immediately I think of they have those hats with fur. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, light skinned, blonde hair. Okay. Are they funny? Uh, no. S on the serious side? Yeah. Well, what's a Russian like? Drinks a lot of vodka. Drinks a lot of vodka. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Those of you who have never met a Russian, what's a Russian like? They like everything big. They like everything big. Okay. Now, by the way, we got there. Th some of them had never met an American before. And yet they, they exactly thought what Americans were like. They, they kind of knew. We're loud. Uh, so I remember walking down the streets of Moscow, and there was a pizza hut. Uh, and I said, hey, pizza hut. Everybody turned around on the streets. It was like, uh, do Russians like their personal space or not? There's no personal space in Moscow. You're always on top of somebody, always. And you go to eat at a restaurant, so you're sitting right there uh, because there's no room. Uh, Oh, come on, sit right down, right here. You're like, and, they're t and you're like, well, I'm t I'm, now how can I have a conversation with my wife with you sitting like right there? Well, that's just how it is in cafes in Moscow. That's just how it is. Um, so predictive generalizations about other people or experiences. A faculty member invited us over for dinner, and uh, I got there ahead with me and Noreen because the boys were coming from football practice, and uh, this faculty member says, oh, tonight we're having Thai food. And I was like, he said, particularly seaweed wraps. And I was like, by the way, do you see what just happened? Uh, uh, a, uh, a construct just kicked in. OK, this is going to be disastrous. Seaweed, uh, and stereotype. I'm just like, oh my goodness, what? Oh, it's like a Thai food? I never had Thai food in my life, never. But I'm sitting there going, Thai food? So my honest, totally true story. The three boys come up, and I, I meet them out in the parking lot. And I say to them, listen, guys, tonight we're having Thai food. You will eat it. You will say you like it. And afterwards, I promise I'll take you to In-N-Out Burger. I promise. Okay? And they're like, oh, okay. So they sit down, 
we get our seaweed wraps. And Jason's like, <laughs> I'm like, Jason, they were eating like, it was unbelievably good. It was unbelievably good. And they're just like, um, but that's a stereotype, right? Thai food. I never had Thai food. I had a really bad impression of Thai food. Are there states in the country you just have a, a, a real clear thought about? States in, the, in our country? Utah. What? Utah. Utah. By the way, I'm going to Salt Lake City tomorrow for a marriage conference. But yeah, Utah. T what, what about Utah, by the way? Yeah, okay. Mormon. Texas is what? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes. New York. Oh, in a good or bad way? Um, maybe in a bad way, like okay. always rushed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy busy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Alabama. What about Alabama? The South. <laughs> uh, Mississippi. Anybody from Mississippi? Okay, Mississippi. <laughs> yes. Okay, but in a good or bad way? Uh, in Wisconsin? Yeah. I'm from the Midwest. Uh, but mi Wisconsin? It's no Michigan. Yes. Maine. Maine. Good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think most people think in California that the surfers are. Oh. Guys, when, I, when we accepted the job to come here, I swear to you, we had two people from our church pull us aside and say, honestly, we, we could not do that to our kids. Seriously, we could not take them to California because it's, it's liberal mecca of the world. I, Two, one was a fairly close friend, and we were like, they, ha they know, you know, but California. You know what I mean? It's like, and now that we've been here, oh, it's true. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we love California. California has been great. Uh, yeah, we've been very pleased. But you see, stereotypes. Now, uh, are stereotypes, stereotypes are not necessarily false. Now, don't think of a stereotype as being, well, that's false, because New York is busy. It's crazy busy. So a stereotype in and of itself, it, not true or false, it could be true and still be a stereotype. Okay, so don't think of stereotypes as just inherently negative or untrue things. Uh, okay, now the next one, number four, and again, we're just talking about uh, cognitive schemata. Number four, fourth type of schemata, is what we call scripts. Scripts, simply put, are guides to action. They are our views of what is, two things, appropriate in a situation and expected in a situation. And by the way, you have scripts for virtually everything, right? Uh, what is the elevator script? Actions in an elevator. What's the elevator script? Look forward, don't say anything. Look forward, don't say anything. Look at the numbers. Well, you have to turn around to get in. Yeah, you, you get in, you just kind of turn around. Unless you have a psychology major yeah. who's going to do an experiment <laughs> where they turn and face everybody and you're like, Okay, but we know, um, what's the uh, first date script? Your first date, what's the script? Now, this is where we see gender, right? Because there's, there's different scripts, but a male script, a female script, but what's the script for a first date? The guy pays for the girl. Guy pays for the girl. Even though both are poor, <laughs> we have no money whatsoever, but the script is we're going to pay for this thing, yeah. Okay. Another one would be open the door for her. Yeah, open the door for the girl, part of the script. What else? On a first date, do you laugh at what he or she says? On the first date? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, I didn't quite. Yeah. The, it was a gorilla. Yeah, that's good. Yes. Don't do anything that George from Seinfeld. Don't do anything George from Seinfeld would do. Okay, good. Um, we have evangelism scripts. We have, um, oh, oh uh, so I'm a young father, brand new father, and 
Michael comes into my room and says, Dad, I'm really scared. I've seen a monster in my room. I go, okay. But I never got a memo on this. Okay? So what do I do? I take his hand, I walk in, turn on the light, say, buddy, there are no monsters here. Dad, it could be under the bed. I go, oh, okay. So what do I do? I get on my hands and knees, look under the bed, reach my hand, and I go, look my, ah! <laughs> no, okay, just. <laughs> and then you find out what the child therapist script is like, and it's just a very helpful thing to me. <laughs> Any traumatic events? Well, the, mo the fake monster in the bed. Okay, good, that's good. That'll explain the wedding. Okay, so I mean, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we have those scripts, don't we? Um, the engaged script, how do you propose? Now, your script is, there's two types of script. There's a broad general cultural script, but you better believe that script has changed regionally, and your family had some scripts and not other scripts. Uh, Noreen has a very set script about manners at the dinner table. This is how young boys and men are supposed to act. And it's a very set script. And, and some disagreement we had early in our marriages, I didn't necessarily, that wasn't my script. Um, so, and by the way, marriage is like that. Marriage is comparing all these scripts. First Saturday we were married, getting back from the honeymoon. First Saturday, we're in this condo. Noreen, I, I plopped down to watch a, a college game. I've got my soda, I got my chips, I'm sitting down. Noreen walks out with work gloves and says, hey, Saturday, you want to come help me? We're going to do yard work. And I said, she said, well, you're not going to sit and watch that game all day, are you? I said, well, actually, there's one on after it. <laughs> and, you know, these different scripts, okay? I love what one man had to say. He said, without, without custom, we could not even walk across the room. Without the aid of custom, we would not even be able to walk across the room. And when you get to a foreign uh, country or, or some experience that's different, you realize, boy, there's scripts for all of this kind of stuff. Um, the old joke in Moscow, everything's metro, you know, uh, subway. Uh, why does the Soviet man read a book on the subway? So he doesn't have to see the woman standing. What's the old joke? And, and Soviet men would just read a book, and women would be, elderly ladies would be standing up and getting tossed, and a man's reading a book. And so we were always giving up our seats. And women would just, oh, oh, and he was like, no, 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 please take my seat. Okay? So does that make sense? These are what we call cognitive schemata. They're these mini systems you use in your head. And uh, by the way, we can ask the question, we're reading the Quran in this class, and, and how quickly you kicked into your uh, personal constructs, is this good, bad? Is this interesting, not? Is this well written or not well written? Uh, things like that would happen. Um, no doubt we all had stereotypes about the Quran before we actually read it. We had a, a thought of what this whole thing would be like, things like that. Uh, okay, any questions about that? Thoughts, questions, responses? Well, the Quran, some of my thoughts were, stereotypes were totally true. And okay. And were totally false. Okay, good. So that's what yeah. I noticed. Good. And sometimes our stereotypes, we realize, boy, that, that really has borne out to be true. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes we shatter our stereotypes. Before I got to UNC Chapel Hill, the only thing I knew about feminism is it was wrong. Mm -hmm. so, why? Because my pastor had said it was wrong up front. That's it. That's all I knew about feminism, is that it was wrong. And so when I got to UNC Chapel Hill, I was a teaching assistant under Julia Wood in her gender class and had my stereotypes exploded, right? Even a Christian uh, and a being a feminist, do, are those two compatible? Kind of an attitude like that. Um, yeah, so we use these all the time. Makes sense? Uh, and, very, and some of us uh, rely on more some more than others, but we use them. Now we get to the second concept that is my all-time favorite. Uh, if the first one is schemata, the second one is what we call cognitive complexity. And so number two, broad category number two, cognitive complexity. 
by that, we, uh, we ask the question, how elaborate uh, or complex is a person's interpretive process? How elaborate or complex is a person's interpretive process? Cognitive complexity. Now, there's no doubt on some issues we're really complex. One could say our theology, our Christian beliefs, we're fairly complex. When it comes to the faith of other people, we're not so complex. And how we interpret people are not, is not very complex. Now, before we get to the three dimensions of cognitive complexity, let me, show you a uh, let, let me share a story with you, and then we'll work through the three dimensions, okay? Uh, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, hockey town, uh, but uh, baseball was really popular back then, and a family friend of ours took us to a baseball game at Detroit Stadium. We were out in right field, it was really hot, in front, and it was me and my two older brothers and a family friend. In front of us was an African-American couple eating fried chicken. And it smelled unbelievable. So we're hot, we're in right field, this family is eating fried chicken. We are like vultures leaning over. Well, the woman <laughs> notices. She could not help but notice, right? She happens to turn to me and says, if your dad says it's okay, you can have some. And we're like, yes, okay? Well, I turned to our family friend. I said, hey, she said we could have some. I'll never forget what he did. He's put his hand on my knee, squeezed my knee, said to her, no, thank you, and then leaned over, whispered in my ear, we don't take food from those kind, okay? So, now, when we hear a story like that, the question is, how elaborate is our interpretive process of that kind of a story? Okay, so let's break down the three different dimensions. First is what we call differentiation. Differentiation. It is measured by how many distinct interpretations Uh, in individual uses. Okay, how many distinct interpretations do you have when you encounter a situation or a person? So, applying that, let's go back to our Detroit Tiger Stadium incident and let's ask the question, how many interpretations do we have of what our family friend did and said? What's one interpretation? He's racist. Now, let's just stop right there. Even if that's true, he's racist, but you only have one interpretation, you're not cognitively complex. You may have the right interpretation, but you're not cognitively complex. Okay? So, for sure, one major interpretation of that is going to be he's racist. What are other interpretations? Yes? He's overcautious about strangers in general. Okay, yeah. He's, he's overcautious about strangers. And I don't know these people. I remember one time, honestly, taking Michael and Jason to a movie, and a woman in front of us had bought one of those never-ending popcorn bowls where you can go back and get refills and then you want. Well, I'm sitting with my two kids. She turns around with her popcorn bowl and, and says, hey, would you like some? Would your kids like some? And I'm like, lady, I'm not monk, but I am not. I mean, she's been, you know, and I'm like, I, no, thank you. Okay? So, yeah, he's, he's being overprotective. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Hey, if we were playing the Yankees that day, I forget the team. If it was the Yankees, that was the moral thing to do. You do not take food from a Yankees fan. Because that's, you just don't. That's the evil empire. Okay? What else? Yes? What's that? Sure. Yeah, yeah, maybe the popcorn make me sick. And Okay, what else? Other interpretations? Yeah? 
Oh yeah, popcorn's horrible for you. Right, it, it's horrible for you. So, and so is fried chicken, by the, I mean, <laughs> it tastes great. But you all heard how many fat grams are in, in popcorn chicken? I mean, chicken, uh, <laughs> popcorn with butter put on it? It's, it's like, you know, it's like death in a bowl, okay? What would be some other interpretation? How about looking at the couple, it's obvious they don't have much money. Okay, just the way they're dressed. And the family friend either has money or is given money by my parents to say, hey, go get, you know, seven inning stretch, go get him something to eat. My dad hands him a wad of cash. So he's looking at him saying, you know, we really don't need to take your money. Thank you, but no thank you. Okay? Now that's kind of offset by that last comment, which is we don't take food from those kind. But the, even that phrase, you'd have to ask, how many different interpretations do I have of that particular th uh, remark? Now, the way you figure this out, obviously, is you engage the person. It's what we call perspective taking. So you jump in and you engage this person to find out. But let me just show you the importance of, of cognitive complexity. Uh, Noreen's making dinner at home. I'm late. Noreen comes up with the interpretation there it is again, Tim's putting work above family, right there. That's why he's late. He cares more about work than he does about family. Now, what would be the danger of being locked into that one interpretation, of only having that one interpretation? What would be the danger of that? Yeah, not only are there other interpretations of reality-wise, but I now, how is Noreen feeling about me when I walk through the door? Yeah, she's angry at me. Because in her mind, she's saying, see, here it is again. I know this is true. What are other interpretations? I'm, l I'm stuck in traffic. What else? Got in a car accident? She could have been shopping for food. For dinner. Oh, and a surprise her. Good. That probably wouldn't work with Noreen. But I like it. I like it. Because she has a history. Yes? Saving a kitten out of a tree. Saving a kitten out of a tree. Uh, a student stops by un unexpectedly and I need to deal with it or something I forgot I need to deal with, right? Other interpretations. Now, by the way, when I walk through the door, she's going to land on an interpretation because she's going to say to me, hey, honey, kind of late? And I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, honey, you won't believe it. I was rescuing a kitten from a tree and got abducted by an alien. <laughs> you know what I mean? but, but having multiple interpretations uh, we don't jump into one line of thinking, and by the way, that line of thinking could be wrong. By the way, how does the stereotype play into this? A stereotype would be, see, those academics, they're always scatterbrained, so he probably forgot, I mean, you know what I mean, that kind of a, kind of a thing. So first, we have to ask ourselves, how many distinct interpretations do we have of that professor who we think was upset at us and said an offhanded comment. How many interpretations do we have of President Corey's decision about the Jesus mural? How many interpretations do we have of uh, the next door neighbors uh, not waving to us when we drove by? I waved to them. I, I could have sworn he saw me. They did not wave. Okay, they're antisocial. Well, there you go. Got that wrapped up. <laughs> How long did that take? Oh, about three seconds. We're good. Now we've got an antisocial. Whoa! Are there other possible interpretations? Okay? So the first one is called differentiation. Okay, very important. Second is what is called abstraction. Abstraction. This focuses on the extent by which you interpret others, particularly their internal motives, uh, their character, even personality traits. So abstraction is when you're interpreting the actions of another person, how much are you taking into consideration and do you know about their internal motives? Okay, I mean, um, what's happening emotionally with that person, intellectually with that person, uh, is incredibly important. So, go back to my family friend. 
Uh, what happened in Detroit in 1968? What happened in 1968 in Detroit? Anybody know? Race riots happened in Detroit. To the extent that me being a young child, I remember three times my dad calling home from General Motors telling my mom to pack up the car, we're leaving. Uh, the National Guard was called into Detroit. I remember my dad driving us around the perimeter that they had set up where there was an actual tank uh, on a corner of a street corner, uh, guardsmen with uh, automatic weapons making sure the rioting didn't get into the suburbs. Now, in the process of that, my friend's uh, family business was burnt to the ground. He did not have adequate insurance, and the family business was never picked up again. It basically died that day. So my friend um, uh, blamed black people for that. Okay, now add a stereotype to that, right? Blame black people, angry people, never content, blah, 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 blah. Now, what does that do to you hearing that piece of information? Yeah? You don't agree with him, but you can understand where he's coming from better. Okay. Yeah, it's not condoning it. You still might think, that's a racist comment. But, but then you ask yourself this question. He's a family friend. And my parents entrusted three kids to him. So he's not, is he an out-and-out -out racist? Maybe. But understanding the fuller context provides a little bit of understanding. What else can it do to learn the fuller context? If we thought of him just in terms of being a racist, how do we respond to him? Negatively, Negatively probably aggressively, we're going to confront him. I can't believe you said that comment. That's, that's crazy talk, right? Um, but understanding the context produces, hopefully, empathy. Hey, what if that was my family business that now is handed off to me and now it's burnt to the ground? Um, Sympathy, which is, that's kind of tough. That's a, that's a tough thing. Longfellow once said this, if we knew the secret history of our enemies, it most likely would produce compassion. Okay? So now, by the way, it does not condone what he said. It doesn't. Uh, there's one of my favorite communication books by Pierce and Littlejohn called Moral Reasoning. Uh, in it, they did something that got them in a lot of trouble. They actually, <coughs> post 9-11, presented the picture of a terrorist and then gave his background story. And just said, listen, he's a farmer. Uh, the imam, who is the voice of God in his village, has, since he was a child, told him that the West, particularly America, are devils. And they are against everything holy, everything in the Quran and that one day Allah will judge these devils and make a blow against them. Well, he's recruited into a terrorist cell that tells them now's our chance to take a, uh, a hit against the Western devils in the name of Allah, and this terrorist actually does it. And they actually got into a lot of trouble because some people said, boy, you're painting a sympathetic picture of these terrorists. And he simply said, no, I'm, I'm pre presenting a humane picture of these terrorists. Elie Wiesel, who wrote Night, how many people have read Night? He went through Auschwitz, and Adolf Eichmann, who designed many of the horrible death camps and even the experiments within the death camps, was on trial. This was the Nuremberg trials. Elie Wiesel went there expecting to see a monster. And he wrote in his book, One Generation After, he said, you know, if he would have been a monster, it would have been easier for me. He said, if I would have seen the horns coming out of his head. He said, but you know what, we, and people forget about the Nuremberg trials. It was a trial. They had defense <coughs> attorneys. And these defense attorneys said, you know, Adolf Eichmann was a good husband. He was a good father. His men loved him. He's not evil. You're judging him because you won the war. If we were to win the war, you wouldn't even be judging him right now. And Eichmann said, I mean, uh, Elie Wiesel said it was sh so unsettling to him to walk out of there and realize Eichmann was not a monster, he was a human being. And what this does is it forces us to say, 
why did that person do that? Uh, their character, their personality traits. By the way, if you don't know why they did that, uh, go find out. Find out what's spurring them to do that. Uh, one of my favorite classes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Did Wiesel find out why he did it? Like the, the motives that he was... Oh, like sure. Anti-Semitism and believing, and believing that after World War I, Germany was uh, basically forced to sign a treaty that really damaged Germany economically. And while they were in a weakened economic state, Jews came in, according to the Nazi narrative, and took advantage of us in a weakened state and made profit off of our burdens. So Hitler rose on the rhetoric of saying, it's time we undo this treaty. This treaty's been really unfair, and a lot of Germans would agree with that. And the Jews came in and took advantage of us, and they need to pay. And so that, that's an internal motive. We might look at that and say, okay, we need to talk about that, but that's a powerful internal motive to find out. Yeah? Uh, you said about um, people in uh, Islamic countries saying that America, when pre-9-11 world, was the devil. Do you believe now that a lot of the children born after post-9-11 are thinking that Islam might be able to develop this way, their parents are telling them about it? Oh, sure. Good point. Yeah, um, parents might, there might be an overreaction. And again, we see the mosque debate at, at two blocks away from ground zero, where you see a lot of people talking about their opposition in terms of why are we going to build a mosque that close to sacred ground for the very people who did those terrorist acts? To which cons moderate Islam responds, how in the world was that us? And remember that great quote I think I shared? Uh, the KKK is to Christianity what the Taliban are to Muslims. Okay? So, but, but this is powerful. If we don't know the answer to this question, what's driving this person, then we're not complex. Now, maybe we find out what's driving them is anti-Semitism, which, again, we're going to address with that person, but it's so good to know the backdrop, the factors that are, are happening. Make sense? Now, the third one is the most complex, but I think it's the most interesting. And it tells you a lot about yourself pretty quickly. It's called organization. It is the degree to which uh, individuals notice underline that, and are able to make sense of contradictory information and interpretation. Underline the word contradictory. So organization is the degree to which individuals notice and are able to make sense of contradictory information and interpretations. Now, what's so good about organization? Organization would be this. Okay, I look at our family friend. He made a racist comment. He's bad. He's evil. That's it. Okay, well, that, that is not a, a difficult thing to say nor believe, and um, that's my dominant interpretation of what he did. I come back and say, but do you know he's actually been a family friend for about 15 years, and he's really been good to the Mielhoffs, and, and you go, well, no, I don't think he's a good man at all. I can't see him doing any good things as a racist. So what did you just do? You did not acknowledge any contradictory information. Right? There's no way. He's not a good person. Right? Uh, the Quran is wrong. That's it. Well, what about those passages that actually talk about Jesus in a positive way, that talk about God being one, that talk about um, Jesus doing miracles, being born of... Well, I, don't, uh, I don't believe that's in there. Wow. So do you even recognize contradictory information? Uh, you know what I mean? And are you able to make sense of contradictory interpretations? 
One of my favorite examples of this is Philip, uh, uh, Bill Hybels, who's the pastor of Willow Creek Church in Chicago. He actually came out and did a really interesting thing. He said, I've been discipling somebody, very impressed with their Christianity, their love of God, and for the last four years, I've been meeting with this person, discipling them, and I've not gone public until now, and the person I've been discipling is Bill Clinton. And the reaction to that was unbelievable. Some people were like, Bill Clinton is not a Christian. He is not a Christian. How neat, tidy is that? No, actually, he is a Christian. No, he's not. A, well, he loves the Lord. Well, he, he only does that because he wants to get votes. You see how you do that contradictory information? Well, he just wants to get votes. He's just playing that up because he's a politician. He's making, it's like, really? Well, you know, he goes to church. Well, oh, come on. Yeah, he goes to a liberal church. You know what I mean? You discount it almost as fast. But when you hear contradictory information, can a, can a terrorist be a good father? Can a terrorist be an Iranian farmer who takes care of his kids, his wife, and his grandparents? Can he do something out of the love of his religion? And you look at that and you go, okay, I still think what he did was wrong, but that just became more complicated for me. Make sense? Uh, it's easy to demonize a person. It takes away all the need for interpretation and cognitive complexity. How many of you seen, saw the movie United 93? Yeah, powerful movie, isn't it? And that director actually got in trouble because United 93 is about the one plane on 9-11 that they actually, we think the passengers caused it to crash because they attempted to, they knew what was going on. They had gotten information about the other planes and they said, okay, this plane is not going to be used as a missile. And so they actually, we think, caused it to tra uh, crash. But in that movie, very interesting, how they present the terrorists that day. Right? As, as um, they're getting ready to do this, they're actually calling home, saying goodbye to their loved ones. Very powerful scene in the movie that got a lot of criticism. Uh, remember, they're all about to do this. They're about to rush the cockpit. Okay? They've got their boiling water. They're going to use a, uh, 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 a cart as a battering ram. They're all about to go do this. And a couple of them have already said, look, there's no way we're going to get a hold of that cockpit. All that guy has to do is make a sharp turn and this plane's going down. Okay, so I think the chance of this actually working where we get a hold of the cockpit uh, is probably not going to work. Uh, we we kind of piece that together. So they're saying the Lord's Prayer in the back. The Muslim, ter uh, the terrorists realize we're not going to make our final destination because they're about to ram us. They're now saying prayers to Allah. And so there's this really powerful moment. What do you do with that? You know what I mean? No, it is not to condone the acts of 9-11. Absolutely, it's not to condone that. And we wouldn't. We'd say that was morally wrong. I don't care what your internal motivation was for doing 9-11. But if we're ever to uh, have hopes of talking a family friend out of a racist thought or comment, we better treat them in a cognitively complex way. And if we're ever going to make headway with people of, of different beliefs, radical or whatever, we better present them in very complex ways. Because we all know when we're dismissed and not seen as complex. Oh, you Biola people, you let the Bible do your thinking for you. And we're like, well, thanks a lot. Or you Biola people, I know how you vote, I know what you watch, I know, and we're like, you don't know anything about me. So let's not be so quick uh, to form uncomplex. Now, the cool thing about this from a religious standpoint, God has made each individual in a complex way. Each person reflects God's image. Each person is a testimony to God's creative process. So we are to uh, treat people in a, in a complex way, right? So you meet a homeless person. How did you get to be here? What are the circumstances? Now, a stereotype is, well, all homeless don't want to work. They just want a free handout, right? Well, that's a stereotype, a very po powerful stereotype. So cognitive complexity asks the question, how complex is your world, your interpretation of other people, politically, religiously, um, uh, I think it makes all the difference when you treat a person in a cognitively complex way. Okay, so thoughts, 
Uh, reactions. Oh, I got to share the third with, one with you very quickly. So remember our broad outline, uh, constructivism. First, we're taking a look at cognitive schemata, right? And then we talked about prototypes, personal constructs, all that kind of stuff. Second main category, cognitive complexity with three different aspects, differentiation, abstraction, organization. Now, when you approach a person with cognitive complexity, this is what it results in. And that is the third main, the third main category, which is what we call person-centered communication. Person-centered. What does that mean? It means our family friend who said a racist thing if we just kick into, well, I'm going to treat him like a racist. Everything I kind of know about racists, I'm just going to apply to my friend and I'm going to do the standard confronting a racist 101 methodology. Right? And by the way, sometimes as Christians we get locked and loaded in that way, don't we? Oh, you're a feminist. <gasps> you're postmodern. You're Buddhist. Okay, Oops. script number three, subsection four, confronting a postmodern. <laughs> Boom. Right? I mean, we kind of do that, don't we? Person centered communication is to say, here's a family friend of the Muehlhoffs who said a very racist thing. Now, by the way, I'm going to confront him on that comment. I'm going to confront him. But knowing his backstory, knowing his history, knowing what motivates him, is the ball game to actually effectively talking to this person, right? Uh, so person-centered communication is to say all Christians are not the same. All Christians at Biola University are not the same. Uh, everybody at Berkeley is not the same. It's not a cookie-cutter university. Nobody is just a pure postmodern. It's always Bob the postmodern. It's always Karen the postmodern. Right? And why did you embrace that postmodernism? I love asking the question, how did you get to the present? Who were the influential people in your life? Uh, what were the significant events in your life? How did you get to this moment? How many of you were born a Christian? Show of hands. Born a Christian. Born a Christian? Right? No, you became Christian. And I'd like to know all the reasons why you did that. That's person-centered communication. Okay? Now, sometimes it's hard to do that when you're doing uh, um, political speaking. You have to speak to the masses. But for us, on an individual basis, I would argue that cognitive complexity is the, virtually the whole ballgame. People know when they're being treated in a respectful, complex way. They know it. Uh, and I think it's really powerful. Okay, any questions about this? Thoughts, questions? Yeah. So you said the person-centered is a combination of those two? Let me say, a be maybe a better way to say that is it's, a, it's hopefully a result of the first two. By the way, not always the case. But hopefully, it's the end result of the first two. Uh, so person-centered communication, hopefully, is taking into, con uh, taking into consideration the emotional state of a person, uh, taking into consideration their background, uh, taking into consideration uh, the context of the communication. And as Christians, again, I think we have a huge precedent for this because each person is made uniquely in the image of God. Uh, by the way, let me close with this. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. ABC, uh, 2020, the program 2020, I forget which station that is. They used to have this thing that they would do. This was a long time ago. Where a guy from 2020 would go to a city. Go, this is when they had phone booths. okay, And would take a look at the... Um, the directory and close, now this is on camera, close his eyes, open up the phone book and just go, 
boom, and put his, name, his finger on a name. Then, live, he would make a phone call. And this person would answer. He goes, is this, is this uh, Jacqueline Smith? Yes, it is. Well, I'm so-and-so from 2020, and I have a camera crew with me right now. Would it be possible for us to come over to your house and hear your story? Virtually everybody said, oh, you, you do not want to come over to my house. I do not have an interesting story. I, I, I'm a housewife. I don't, and they said, that's okay, that's okay. We just want to come anyway. Would that be okay? And it's like, yeah, oh, well, okay, sure. So they come over. Now, this guy's a very skilled interviewer, okay? But you would not believe the stories. You would not. Now, I'm sure there were some duds and we never saw them. But, I mean, we're sitting there and, like, a guy, a guy's just talking to this woman and says, I can't help but notice all the balloons. And she goes, oh, yeah, we have a, yeah, we have a thing about balloons. Uh, one of my kids um, died in a swimming accident, and on his birthday, we released a bunch of balloons. He always loved balloons. So they finished this clip with everybody releasing it. I mean, you're just sitting there going. And somebody's saying, oh, I don't have an interest in life. I'm a married woman. He goes, how long have you been married? I don't know. We've been married 30 years. He goes, that's awesome. 30 years of marriage. That's really great. What's the secret of marriage? You're an expert. What's the secret of marriage? Well, I don't know. I think you just got to talk to each other. Oh, that's awesome. Well, you know. Right? That, that's cognitive complexity. You know, why do you believe this? What led you to this? I think it's very life-affirming. And psychologists will say acknowledgement is perhaps the, most, the best thing we can do to another person is acknowledge them. Okay? Even if we disagree with them, by the way, acknowledge them. I'm reading a great book about the Veritas Forum um, where they bring together Christians and non-Christians talk about really uh, big ideas like God, life after death, all this kind of stuff. Well, these two guys just did a debate, uh, Christian and non-Christian, and the way they addressed each other was really powerful. Acknowledging the weight of each other's positions, even though I don't happen to be an atheist or I don't, I'm not a Christian, but acknowledging the weight of who they were is very affirming. Okay? We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.